Hello, Sinai. I'm Chris Adams. I'm a member of the Archive Committee of the Flangothan International Musical of Stedford. Thank you for dropping in for this talk about the early days of the Stedford, about how the organisers went about achieving their aim, that an international music festival organised on the model of a Welsh Stedford could make a large contribution to promoting better international relations mainly by the idea of creating better contacts and understanding between ordinary people. It was an ambitious aim and the fact that we're here 75 years later still talking about it suggests that they got on pretty well. The talk will start at the point where the organisers had a good idea about what it was they were going to do. This means I won't be talking about the origins of the idea uh, coming from a suggestion from a senior Czech diplomat who attended the 1943 National Stedford in Bangor. How the seed got to Llangollen, that was a tortuous journey. How the Llangollen Urban District Council, the local authority, helped to germinate it. And how it was brought to bloom by an effort from the entire Llangollen community with a lot of support from the British Council in a few, very few months. So I'm going to illustrate the talk with images and other things from the Stedford archive. This means I'll have to switch on PowerPoint and I'll be leaving you in full screen and I should hopefully reappear occasionally during the talk somewhere on the right hand side of the screen. In 1946, the founders of the Estevford told the world of their aims for the new festival. They did so in two documents. The appeal in August 1946 was distributed around the Flangothlan area. Uh, it asked for funding for loans and donations to provide a float to get the Estevford through to the first expected ticket receipts scheduled for April 1947. It was very successful, raised over a thousand pounds, and it gave confidence for an invitation to be made to the world's choirs to come to Llangollen in June 1947 to sing and to compete with each other. This invitation was sent out to music societies worldwide. It used the organizers networks um, and it also used the extensive network of the British Council uh, through their representatives in British embassies abroad. The document makes the point that international cultural exchanges were seen as important for post-war rehabilitation and reconstruction and emphasises the desire that they be um, extended to include ordinary people and not just to be confined to leaders. They show that Wales had a long history of involvement in peace movements, going back in fact to the time of the Battle of Waterloo when Joseph Tregellis Price, um, a Quaker ironmaster from Neath, was instrumental in setting up the Peace Society. They say Flangothlan itself had a history of being involvement with innovation in Eisteddfaddai, the first modern Welsh nationalist Stedford arguably being held in Llangollen in 1858. They also stressed what a nice place Llangollen was and had excellent contacts with uh, through its transport network. The founders identified then five distinct objectives. The Stedford would provide a great musical experience both for competitors and for audience and it would help to improve standards both through the competition element and the exchange of ideas and techniques. These are of course the standard objectives of any Estefford and have been since the Middle Ages. The specific peace objective promoting international relations between ordinary people was noted and singled out and there were also an objective to improve the reputation of Wales abroad, both by the people who attended the Estedford and by what the rest of the world would hear about it. 
there was a subsidiary hope that this might well attract people to visit Wales and therefore help Wales' tourist industry. Quite a modern set of objectives, quite ambitious and interesting. You can assess the whole history of the festival in terms of how the in terms of the balance between these five objectives and how they've been influenced by external factors, for instance. Let's see how they got on. So if you want to run an international musical event like the Estherford, you need lots of competitors from different countries, from lots of different countries, and you want to present a lot of different cultures. The Estherford tackled this pretty systematically. Thinking first about getting different countries involved, the festival moved quickly from 13 countries in 1947 to over 50 by 1969. This is about the average rate of increase shown over the whole of its 75 years of the Estherford's life. The British Council helped greatly in the early years to spread interest, but the Estherford increasingly used the network established by the musical director. Expansion was helped by adding new competitions, folk dance and folk choral in 1948, thanks to an adventitious uh, display of Spanish dancing in the 1947 Estherford. In a typical year, there would be 20 to 30 different countries showing their cultures in Llangollen. The number of overseas competitors rose quickly from a few hundred in 1947 to nearly 3,000 in the mid 1950s. In 1957, 60 groups competed in the two folk categories on the Wednesday and the competitions ran from nine in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. The audience stayed on for the adjudications. It's worth remembering, though, that um, in, over the years, perhaps half the competitors measured both by groups or by numbers have come from England. So the internationalism was balanced against a strong contribution from the home countries. Two policies contributed to the attraction the estate that held for overseas groups. Uh, to facilitate participation, Overseas for overseas competitors, the Estherford paid all the travel costs within the UK and living expenses while they were in Llangollen. British Rail offered great discounts for groups and the Estherford really exploited the scheme. Second, the Estherford respected the, each group's decision about what they wanted to describe as their cultural, national or political affiliation whether to a whole nation, a region, or a distinctive culture, which could span countries. So in 1951, Indonesian music and dance was brought by a society from Amsterdam with both Dutch and Indonesian participants. This was eased immediately after the war, which had led Indonesia to gain independence from the Netherlands, um, of which it was a former colony. The group knew all about the challenges of reconciliation between conflicted people. Later in the decade, the Mediterranean islands, Corsica, Sardinia and Sicily, all said they wanted to be known for their island homes and not as part of their continental mainlands. This policy had really been introduced to help expatriate groups. Uh, communities displaced by the Second World War and the subsequent disruption in Europe. Ukrainians established themselves in Manchester after the war and outstanding dancers from this community came to the Estherford for many years winning prizes. But most touching is a story from 1948 on the left, uh, a cutting from the News Chronicle, a national newspaper. The winners in the first folk dance competition were Polish teenagers from a refugee camp near Bomaris in Anglesey. They beat the Spanish dancers who had turned up serendipitously in 1947 um, and had so excited the audience with, the, um, with their dancing. 
Polish group is a bit of a mystery since the camps vanished soon after the Eastedford in June 1949. Uh, I often wonder what happened to these boys and how they benefited from their experience in Llangollen. So getting competitors from many different countries wasn't a problem, but how could high standards be ensured? Information about the quality of applicants initially relied upon recommendations and reports from contacts like the British Council. And some groups indeed were specifically invited by the British Council. By the 1950s, however, packages of gramophone recordings were being sent by applicants from all over the world to the musical director's office in Abbey Road, Llangollen, allowing a direct evaluation. Don't forget this is well before YouTube. The Estet had built a reputation that its competitions were worth winning, not only by selecting excellent groups, but by the way the competitions were structured. The test pieces were difficult, but chosen so as not to favour any particular nationality or culture. A strong international team of adjudicators was built, so there was confidence that the results would be fair. One competitor experiencing all this in the 1950s was Pavarotti. He came to Llangollen as a 90-year-old with a male voice choir from Modena, run by his father. They won first prize. Much later, he recalled the experience of winning, and we're going to listen to that in a minute. While you're listening to Pavarotti, have a look at this cartoon from Giles. From 1953, Britain's favourite cartoonist, published in the Sunday Express, then one of Britain's favourite newspapers. He captures the competitive element of the festival very nicely, and really got to grips with the international atmosphere as well. He came to the festival several times and gave an original copy of this cartoon to Dr. Adams Davis, the father of the current chairman. Now on to Pavarotti. Uh, at that time, we were in competition with the 22 finalist coro in the world. Uh, when we left Italy, they told us, if you arrive in the side of the first 10, you are very good because the people there are exceptional choral singers. So I say to myself, and to my father was on my right, I remember like it's now, I say, Papa, it's impossible to sing better than we are doing. And he says, shut up, you are too young. <laughs> that is, <laughs> is what... We went to Langothen, we made the competition. I think we, I, we sang fantastic, beautifully. And they begin, at the end of the competition, they begin to call the number 22, and then 20, and then 16, and then 10, and we are not yet there. So we begin to see each other like that. This is, and then we go back to the number 9, 8, 7, 5, 3. The number 3, the choral master, felt it. Plop, <laughs> down. <laughs> I remember we were under a tree and we gave him a whiskey and we, we, we tried to call him back. In the meantime, they called number two and we were, were not there. So we won the competition. The evening concerts added greatly to the enjoyment people got from the festival. In a typical year, there were six of them from Tuesday to Sunday. There were special opening concerts on Tuesday and a closing one on the Sunday of which more later. The everyday concerts mostly featured competitors performing from their own repertoires rather than the test pieces of the syllabus, so it's a chance to show their individual national cultures. The evenings were leavened with professional singers and musicians, often up and coming performers from around the world. Some were good, some not so good. One great success was the appearance in 1968 of Placido Domingo in an early UK gig. In the early years, the special concerts, called celebratory in the organisation's records, were often spectacular. The Halle Orchestra, conducted by John Barbaroli in 1947, set the standard. In the following years, there came Joan Hammond from Opera, 
Fontaine on Markova from the world of ballet, and Ram Gopal's fusion of classical Indian and Western dance styles. For me, the highlight of this period was the performance of Benjamin Britten's chamber opera, The Turn of the Screw. Only nine months after its pre world premiere in Venice, and well before it went to New York, the Ested that really succeeded in raising the musical standards uh, brought to this part of Northeast Wales. In the 1960s, the concert strategy shifted to illustrating the folk music genre, typically by performances uh, of a professional national company from a single country and some specialities such as mass bands. Despite, despite contributing quality and variety to the Estevo programme, the concerts didn't get much prominence in either publicity or the media reporting. The focus of both was on the competitors and their stories. There was no problem getting people to come to the festival. The audience came by the thousands, perhaps 15,000 for some day sessions, another 10,000 on a fine evening. The Estetha deliberately kept prices low to encourage the highest possible levels of participation and ran an office to help visitors from a distance find accommodation. They were, but these factors were much less important than the sheer excitement of the experience of the music, the dancing, and so many different languages and costumes. There would, might be over a dozen different languages talked around the town and on the field. English wasn't universal then, as it is now. There was no Google Translate. You could mingle with the competitors everywhere. It wasn't just about the stage performances. There was singing and dancing everywhere throughout the town, or you could just catch competitors on the field, walking around like this ladies choir from Porto in 1947, uh, sitting and rehearsing, or just chilling out like these Dutch gentlemen. Malaysians danced in the car park, cowboys danced on the field, groups walked about parading their flags, they danced in the town and the competitors did the sort of everyday tourist things which all visitors to St Gotland do, like a boat ride on the canal. Competitors everywhere and the press photographers had a field day. The papers loved images of encounters between competitors from different countries and encounters with local people, especially Welsh children in costume. It all looks a bit dated and contrived now, and thus didn't really do justice to the spontaneity and conviviality of all the mingling that was going on on the field and off it. It generated a few photographic cliches like the Alpenhorn, which features a lot in the first 10 years. If you were a bit shy, a good way to meet someone was to ask for their autograph. A bit like a selfie, but much more engaging. The Estetva designed autograph books and sold them at a small profit. That's what the girls are using here. But at a pinch, any piece of paper would do, as shown by the top left autographs of the first Portuguese ladies choir that we saw a couple of slides back. Programme pages also provided context, as for John Barbaroli, who must have signed hundreds of autographs in 1947. The couple of thousand overseas competitors were accommodated in the homes of residents in Llangollen and surrounding villages, or on camp beds in halls and schoolrooms. Recruiting householders went beyond Chester, as was June Corwin, more than 20 miles from Llangollen, and finding enough places for them was one of the triumphs of the volunteers supporting the festival. Additionally, each overseas group was assigned a host or hostess to smooth their stay in Llangollen roles much sought after. The competitors often gave concerts in the villages that hosted them. Strong friendships between local families and competitors were made, some of which persisted for generations. Interesting intercultural exchanges are noted in the archive, such as when the 1958 Sicilian dancers attempted to teach a family living up from Bacher, Flangoflin, to cook spaghetti. They brought with them the pasta and the garlic, but were surprised to learn that olive oil was sold only in pharmacies, in small bottles, 
for treating earache. But the result was still a success. The hospitality of the Llangollen estate became legendary. Interestingly, this was one aspect picked up by the picture post in this two images shown here, which come from the 1951 article. The Estevad sought to create a peace related atmosphere surrounding the competitions and the concerts. The shield and the motto, which usually encircles it, were created specifically to capture the ethos of promoting peaceful relations. The poet T. Gwynne Jones from Bettison Rose on the Irish Sea coast was a noted pacifist in World War I. The words of the motto work well in both English and Welsh. He died sadly in 1949. T.B. Huxley Jones was world famous sculptor, originally from Wrexham. He's best known for the statue of Helios, which stands outside BBC Broadcasting House. The griffin is a medieval symbol of leadership and strength, but in its encirclement, I see a possible reference to a common portrayal of the Indian god Shiva as Lord of the Dance. But I don't think I'd make an art critic. An anthem for the Estevad, Song of Freedom, was commissioned from North Wales composer Cyril Ricketts. Unfortunately, it didn't work well and was never performed in the marquee. The audiences were happy to sing hymns when they had the chance. Nevertheless, the idea shows how the Estevad engaged leading Welsh talents to develop its festival. An act of Christian worship was held in Valley Crucis Abbey every Sunday. In 1947, Anglican and Catholic bishops joined in officiating and the Cistercian monks from Caldy Island paraded chanting plain song. It was the first Catholic service officially held in Valley Crucis since the dissolution of the monasteries in Tudor times and a very moving act of reconciliation. I just wish, however, we had a recording of the plain song. No act of reconciliation has been more important to the Estevad than that involving the first German competitors. A young choir from Lübeck, mixed choir, arrived in 1949. They had been formed by the British administration in Lübeck so that they could use music to work with displaced persons. Lübeck was of course a centre for refugees from Eastern Europe. The choir, as it travelled to Llangollen, was anxious about the reception it would get. Although their visit had been arranged by the British Council, it was still one of the first cultural visits by a German organisation to the UK since the war. They needn't have been worried. From the moment they stepped off the train towards the tea and sandwiches hospitality provided across the road from the railway station, they were made thoroughly welcome. Finally, on stage, they were introduced as our friends from Germany to a marvellous ovation. The, these are their photographs and the flag raising ceremony, top left, was important. The German Federal Republic was only a few days old and this was one of the first occasions when their flag had been raised in the UK. The choir returned to Llangollen many times over the years and became fi firm favourites. Definitely a signature event for Llangollen. Finally in this section, the children's message of peace and goodwill. An idea conceived by the Reverend Gwilym Davis, the Irrid movement had been articulating an annual peace and goodwill message since 1922. And since 1924, the BBC had been broadcasting it on Goodwill Day, May the 18th. The editor had been in touch with the Llangollen estate from the start and had used the photographs from Llangollen in the promotional material for its 1949 message. Llangollen's chairman invited the Reverend Davis to come to the third Llangollen estate to present the peace message, but his diaries didn't allow it. Instead, the Estedford selected a girl from Dinas Brown School, Gwentlian Williams, to give the message from the Estedford stage, dressed in Welsh costume. It was a sort of retweet of the Irv text, 
albeit in the rather dramatic format of a single teenager standing alone before an audience of 8,000. Until the 1980s, the Tlangothan presented the Irr message like this every year. The youngsters, usually a girl, were coached by Dinas Brown's staff, but they all had been well prepared by appearing in numerous Sunday school, instead of Adai. Curiously, neither the Eisteddfod nor the media paid much attention. The activity wasn't included in the programme until 1952, and the Irr doesn't mention the Flangothan initiative either in its review of the 1949 peace message, or now, is there any men or now in its Wikipedia entry. From the 1980s, a new format saw the Eisteddfod inviting a local school or schools to create and perform its own message. This has led to increased local participation, produced lots of different formats and a lot more interest. We've no recordings of the early peace messages, so I'd like to share with you the presentation in 1996 by Bryn Coughlin School. This was the 50th of Stedford, and there had been a move to gather on the stage all the earlier presenters of the peace message that could be found. For those with a long history of the Estevard, it's an extremely moving moment. A cleglion in our gun, the scablion, a skull, brin coshen, a cabluniad or neges heduch a meleni. The message for this year, the choir will sing a specially commissioned work, Ian Taylor, one family, the words by Robin Suid Abouen, music by Arian Williams. Discoverion a skull Bryn Cosen. So it's time to think about how news of the festival got out to the world and what the world made of it. The first point is that it's indisputable that for the period we're talking about, the first 25 years, the Llangollen Eisteddfod was seen as a British festival as much as a Welsh festival, and it was of great international interest. I illustrate this with the front cover of the Radio Times, Stedford Week 1958. It's the Scottish edition, but it still shows the Flangothan and Stedford in the cover. A UK festival, definitely. The BBC is the first port of call to talk about media coverage. It had started with Flangothan in 1947, um, recording and broadcasting Flangothan over to the world on the radio. Competitors singing, 
interviews with the visitors and personalities. TV came very quickly, established as one of the first major outside broadcast sites covered by the BBC. And there was a big BBC presence for the week. The relationship was made closer because many of the stage presenters for the week were um, BBC announcers, um, moonlighting and enjoying themselves in Llangollen. Independent television joined in the 1960s and Pathé News was there virtually until 1970. There's a unique record of the 50s and 60s Estevez on the Pathé News website, well worth a look. In many years there were 50 or more journalists in Llangollen from national and regional papers. The first four years were reported in the New York Times. Photo magazines like Picture Post, Illustrated, London News loved the event, as we've seen. There were general periodicals like The Spectator who reported from the festival. So did many music journals. In 1953, there was even an article in the Reader's Digest, uh, a short version of something that had appeared in America. The Estevlid assiduously courted powerful connections and supporters. The first patron in 1947 had been the local MP, but in 1948 he withdrew after Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh accepted the invitation to become the patrons. They were very gracious to the festival and when the Queen's tour of North Wales in 1953, after the coronation, was being scheduled, the dates were chosen so that she could visit Slangothlan while the Estevald was on. There was also a change of president in 1948, Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan accepting the invitation. This set the mark that the president would be a leading member of the UK government, normally the Foreign Secretary. In the 60s though, it became the Welsh Secretary rather than the Foreign Secretary who had the honour. Session presidents for a week came from a wider world. Ambassadors, heads of businesses, heads of organisations, politicians. Harold Wilson came as Prime Minister in 1968, quickly followed by Ted Heath, the leader of the Conservative opposition, and Jeremy Thorpe for the Liberal Party. Finally, honorary vice presidents also came from many fields. Of the 1947 vice presidents, special mention should be made of Jan Masaryk, the leader of Czechoslovakia after the war, who died during the 1948 Russian takeover. He wrote many letters to the British press extolling the virtues of the festival in 1947. Figures from the Welsh cultural elite also joined in 1947, like Augustus John and Megan Lloyd George. Many more came in in 1948. Finally, many organisations linked, the, linked themselves to the festival. United Nations Organisation and UNESCO had representations on the field. The British Council organised a summer school from 1948 to 1952, bringing about 40 young people from around the Commonwealth and Empire to Llangollen. And the Festival of Britain was chose Llangollen as one of its sites, a significant recognition at the time. The spectators coverage in 1948 is typical of the time. It talks about many nations, an exuberant festival atmosphere, and the townspeople receiving their visitors as friends. And it makes a reference to the aesthetic of its raising of musical standards. Available on the Spectator website if you want the full story. In 1952, UNESCO sponsored a double LP of the International Estevlid. The sleeve notes are written by the Executive Secretary of its International Music Council and they're interesting again, there are lots of them on the back of the album. So just four highlights or three highlights. 
It so admirably implements the principle of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Well, this was being written at the time that the Esteveled was getting th working through its preparations in 1946. So it was very much a child of its time. Throws into relief the characteristics of native musical cultures. The groups represented their nations. The impromptu performances become a practical demonstration of friendship between nations. Again, this was spot on for the sort of atmosphere which the Estelle was trying to create. It's also a very interesting record because one side has six or seven performances of the same song by different choirs. So you do get something of the, of the experience of sitting through a competition in the Exvedric tent. Lots of people wanted a piece of Flangoflin. There were imitators. The 1949 Spanish um, festival in Madrid was dedicated to Flangoflin, but it didn't really survive beyond 1949. The Teesside Stedford, set up in 1966 uh, as an aid to promote economic regeneration, is still going. So too is the 1981 Rhoda Port in South Africa. Uh, Stedford helped to found both these, these um, events, provided practical support to Teesside by giving its chairs for the week. And Teesside was able to reciprocate in the 70s when the Estevad had problems with its marquee. Tangotham was the site where collaborations happened. In 1949, an International Folk Music Society was founded. And in 1978, the first steps were taken to form a European choir from six countries from the EEC. They came back in 1980 to do a Sunday evening concert. And a curious quirk, in 1963, there was a choir from the United Nations Secretariat in New York. This had members from 23 different countries. They came a creditable sixth in the mixed choir competition. Let's keep going. Competitors have always been among the best ambassadors for the Flangoflin Estevard. North Wales residents traveling in Europe, going to conferences, things like that, in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, frequently report encountering people who had been competitors at Flangoflin and had reported favorably on the experience. But this story is a bit different. It's about a choir from Bakersfield, California, who in 1965 won the mixed voice competition in Flangoflin. They were on a European tour, which also included performing for the Pope in the Vatican. Flying back to Los Angeles, their flight was diverted so that they could perform for President Johnson at the White House. This had been organized by local politicians. It gives us this lovely shot of the president inspecting the uh, Flangoflin shield. The choir master, Joseph Husty, was bringing choirs back to Flangoflin as recently as, 90, as two years ago. So a long friend of the Estherford. Some contributions from the world of culture. In 1953, the BBC paid Dylan Thomas 20 guineas for a radio talk, 15 minute radio talk. There are no known recordings, but his text, available in the compilation quite early one morning, provides an evocative language which captures the poet's emotional response to a multicultural wonderland. It's deeply moving, and the Estedward has used it on a number of occasions to illustrate points. The a few television programmes made about the festival have also used Welsh actors with reading excerpts uh, 
astonishing historic text. But two years late, earlier, Wales's Barbara Cartland, Berta Ruck, wrote a novel about a love affair, an international love affair, at, an, at a festival in a town not unlike Llangollen. Not my taste in literature, I'm afraid, but she visited the 1951 Estadford and the book is dedicated to her 12 year old guide, the chairman's daughter, and my late sister-in-law. So a deeply personal connection to the book. I saved my favourite to last. The World Still Sings is a documentary made in 1964 by Jack Howells and produced jointly by Jack Howells own company and the Esso Petroleum Company. In 1962 Howells had won an Academy Award for his documentary on Dylan Thomas and at the time of the Estevwood film he was also working for independent television on a programme about an Iron Devon. By opting to film the Flangothlin Estevwood he placed the festival firmly in the pantheon of Welsh icons with a positive international reputation. It's an interesting film. He goes back to the home countries of several competitors and traces their preparation for the festival and their journey to Llangollen. You can see the BBC celebrities there. You can see a royal visit. You get a real sense of the festival at the peak of its um, prowess. The title responds to the closing lines of Dylan Thomas's 1953 radio broadcast. Are you surprised that people still can dance and sing in the world on its head? The only surprising thing about miracles, however small, is that they sometimes happen. The world still sings. Of course, if you're going to have miracles, some theologians will tell you that you need angels and saints. Angels and saints are definitely the volunteers. In the 25 years we're talking about, it was almost entirely a voluntary effort. There was a single part-time paid administrative assistant. Perhaps up to 800 people a year helped to put the festival on and to do the work necessary to keep it appearing year after year. I haven't got photos of all the volunteers, we wouldn't have room to show them. So I'm showing you the elected leadership, the standing board from 1963. Many of these have been in place since 1947 and so we have a management system which was extremely stable. In calculating the cost of the Estevford, you need to add in the days spent writing letters organising things, making telephone calls, the evenings lost to committee meetings and the sleepless nights worrying about whether it would all happen again. We owe them all, all volunteers, a great deal for what they have done. We are in their debt. That concludes our story of the first couple of decades of the Llangollen International Musical Estevford. I believe that it shows the festival was unique and was very highly regarded in the United Kingdom and round the world. But if you like fairy stories, you'll want to know what happens next. Good news is that international expansion has continued since 1970 at a nominal rate of two new countries or regions every year. However, much of the increase comes from the breakup of the Soviet bloc countries, USSR, Yugoslavia, into smaller nations, each small nation equipped with a cultural budget to help nation building. The drop in the real cost of long haul airfares has also made it easier to get to Flangothland from the Pacific, from Asia, from Africa and from South America. The total number of competitors now exceeds 400,000 but about half have come from outside the UK. England in total has been by far the biggest contributor. Sadly, annual overseas numbers have fallen since the millennium. 
following changes in the UK procedures for admitting amateur musical groups to the country. The less good news is about money. The change is illustrated here by the first overt sponsorship in the 1970s, a tobacco company anxiously using art sponsorship to offset the bad press that tobacco was getting because of the association with lung cancer. This was a big change for the Estadford. In the 1940s and 50s, the Estadford made good surplus each year, despite keeping ticket prices low and giving full hospitality to overseas competitors. By 1957, it had accumulated sufficient funds to buy the land which was to become its permanent home. In the 1960s, it more or less broke even on operations and used grants from the Arts Council and from local authorities for improvements, but not to run day-to-day -day costs. The 1970s were very different. They brought inflation, increased costs and lower attendances. The responses from the Estevard included raising ticket prices, recovering costs of travel and accommodation from competitors, selling commercial concessions on the field um, and sponsorship. The financial pressures continue to this day and they significantly impact every aspect of the way the festival operates. Since the late 60s there have also been many other changes which have affected the Stedford strategies. For instance the explosion in the number and culture of music festivals since Woodstock and the Isle of Wight. The growth of a Welsh national identity starting with Trewerin and especially since devolution. The ongoing fusions in world music and the peace movement refocusing on human and civil rights as well as international relations. How each of these affected the Estadford merits a separate talk, which we don't have time for today. So for a nice uplifting finish, here's an extract from a video put together in 2004 to support the nomination of the Estevford for the Nobel Peace Prize. You'll hear and see competitors from South Africa, Iraq, Canada and Northern Ireland, all saying the sorts of positive things about the Llangollen experience which competitors have been saying ever since 1947. I was rather shocked to learn that uh, some of the music that we've been singing was to a large extent smuggled into Robben Island whilst Mandela and all the other leaders were locked up there in jail. But we believe very strongly that uh, what the politicians could not say, we were privileged enough to be able to sing about and we kept the hope high and we kept our people with this wonderful feeling that one day we will overcome and South Africa will be free. What we have enjoyed during our stay here is the love, the warmth of the people and also the cultural differences whereby people come from all parts of the world but in music and in art we are in a position to work together and almost be able to understand each other and I think what we are saying is that we also wish that the same atmosphere could prevail in our own country. We don't have any country but we show so many people we are a nation and we got culture, we got language. That's what we are glad now and we are very happy now. It's really nice, the sights here and the mountains here. It's really nice and I also like the girls here. It's good crack. We hope you've enjoyed this slice of the history of the Flangotlan International Musical at Stedford. We also hope that you agree with us that it was a remarkable achievement that it be put on and that it did a great deal towards addressing its objective of improving relationships between ordinary people brought together by their love of music. If you're interested in the work of the archive, you can always find us at archive at flangotland.net. And if you'd like to know a bit more about the history itself, we recommend this little book, Tales of the Estevard, which you can find on Amazon. Finally, 
Thank you for your attention and please stay safe.